Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, welcome. How the heck are you doing? We are well into fall right now, so how is your fall going? I'm just going to jump right in and tell you about today's episode with Alexis Devine. I think you're really going to enjoy it. We talk about sensitive dogs, reactivity. Alexis is a family dog mediator. If you listen to episode 158, I had a conversation with Alexis that was so amazing. We just wanted to do a couple of recordings. And she talks about dogs have this fight, flight, or freeze response, but they don't often know the flight response and it has to be taught. We talk about her dog, Bunny, and Alexis talks about all the ways that her dog is sensitive. We talk about my dog with her barking and reactivity. This is relevant even if you don't have dogs, I think, to parenting, to having relationships with other people. We talk about the philosophy that Alexis has around working with animals and that they're sentient beings and how much respect she has for them. And I think the ways that we've been hard on ourselves and we've gotten negative messages, how this can translate, how we can use self-compassion. I don't know. I just think this is an amazing episode. And if you do have any pets, we talk about ways that you can do enrichment for your dogs, ways that you can work with some challenges that you have. I mean, my favorite thing that she said, and I think it's going to be the title of this episode, I record these intros right after we record and I don't have a chance to really process. But she said, they're not giving us a hard time, they're having a hard time. And we talk about understanding behavior and how much Do we want people to understand our sensitivities as opposed to thinking that we're just trying to give people a hard time? I don't know. I just think it's an amazing episode. And my hope is that y'all really enjoy these conversations because Alexis is willing to come back again. And I would love to have her come back to share more. So let me tell you a little bit about Alexis Devine. Alexis Devine is an artist and entrepreneur hailing from Seattle, Washington. She's a licensed family dog mediator and a certified canine enrichment technician. Her sheepadoodle bunny, known as What About Bunny on social media, became an internet sensation in the fall of 2020, when videos of her communicating with assistive technology from Fluent Pet went viral. Bunny now has over 100 buttons, individually programmed with various words that she uses to communicate how she feels, what she wants to express when she's in pain, and even to chat about her dreams. She is part of an ongoing canine cognition research study at the Comparative Cognition Lab at UCSD. They have recently added a standard poodle to the family named Otter, who Alexis is training with the same system. Alexis's goal is to further our understanding of the power of connection and importance of two-way communication, meeting her dogs where they are and understanding them on their terms first to facilitate trust and promote an environment that supports them as the incredible creatures they are. The other thing that we talk about at the very end of this episode are ways that her dog, Bunny, has used to communicate that she has been hurt or injured and how Bunny knew that something was wrong with Otter, their other dog. I I mean, I just think that this whole concept of communication with animals and how much they know and Bunny talks about her dreams, it's just fascinating. I hope you enjoy this episode. I am just, I'd love to talk to Alexis a million times more about this. It's just fascinating to me. And now on to the show. Hey, Alexis, welcome back. Thank you so much again for having me. I am so excited. I just I want to talk to you today for days. There's just so much I want to talk to you about. Let's start out by talking a little bit about sensitive dogs and reactivity. And then I'm going to have you talk a little bit about what it means to be a family dog mediator. But can you either talk about what your knowledge is of dogs that are sensitive, what that looks like, or what you see in Bunny? Yeah, I am a sensitive person myself. So I recognize a lot of the things that I see in Bunny as things that I have struggled with as well. Just sort of always keyed up, always looking for the next 
stimulus to my nervous system that's going to sort of send me over the edge, finding it difficult to relax, finding it difficult to maintain an even keel throughout the day, being thrown off by sudden environmental contrast, sort of needing things to go a certain way or having a bit of a meltdown. Something happens that I don't expect or I'm not able to keep to my routine. See, I'm talking about me and Bunny at the same time, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it can really it can really throw us off. And I think in addition, there's a level of sensitivity to the way people around her and other dogs around her are feeling. She's much more in tune with how I'm feeling day to day than Otter is. Otter's much more easy, go lucky, sort of rolls with the punches. And Bunny and I are not like that. I'm like, I need my structure. I need to know what's going to happen. I like my routine. I don't like surprises. And Bunny is very much the same way. And I think those probably all have a lot to do with her and my level of sensitivity. Well, and the gift that you bring to Bunny, and for you, the listener, I'm assuming if you're listening and you don't have pets, this is of interest to you. But for you, the listener who has other people in your life that have sensitivities, you're more in tune to that because of your own nervous system. And I think the place where we struggle is when we're not attuned with either our partner or our child or our boss or our pet and our temperament styles are different. And I think the gift that we have is the ability to shift perspectives and know what it's like when somebody is more in tune to these things and when they're not. So we have an awareness and we can look for it as opposed to someone who just doesn't have those sensitivities is going to miss those cues either in their pet or with their partner or their child or their parent or their boss. And so while it can be draining sometimes, it also means that we have this great ability to attune in a way that most people don't. And we often have tremendous incredulation and frustration that other people don't see and aren't aware of the things that we recognize. I do this water fitness class and this person brings, I assume it's their service dog to the pool and they set the service dog near the speaker and the dog's ears go back and the dog does a lot of lick lipping and yawning. And when the class is over and the owner takes the dog. The dog's demeanor totally changes, is happy and, and, you know, very carefree. But even today I was petting the dog and somebody walked by and dropped something and the dog just scooted because, out of fear. And it's been so painful for me to watch this little dog. And I don't think that the owner is aware of these things that I'm seeing because yeah. I'm looking for them. <laughs> yeah, that's hard. It's yeah. hard to know how to help or what to say or if to say anything. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. One perspective that I've really liked as we begin to talk about reactive and sensitive dogs is they're not giving us a hard time. They're having a hard time, right? So I love that. If she's having a meltdown, she's not like trying to annoy me. She's not being a bad dog. She's having an emotional reaction because something in her environment is too much for her to handle. And approaching situations like that with compassion is really the only way. So yeah, I mean, that's something that I, that I instantaneously, as soon as I heard it, took to heart. And it, of course, it makes so much sense. And it helps me in my own life, too, if I'm feeling a particular way about something out of control. It's not like, oh, my God, what's wrong with me? It's just like my sensory system, my nervous system can't handle this right now. Maybe I should remove myself from this environment. Or like, what can I do to right. self-soothe right now? And so the learning that I've done through Bunny's reactive journey has really helped me address some of my own reactivity as well, because I learned so mm. much from her being able to view some of my own symptoms through this new lens mm -hmm. in a non-human person who's sort of completely dependent on the decisions that I'm going to make for them. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about a, some of Bunny's sensitivities and how you've worked with her and what you've done to help her with some of those things? And then if we have time, I'd love to talk to you about my little barky dog. Of course. So Bunny is extraordinarily sound sensitive. Mm -hmm. And when she was younger, it was everything. It was like a drop of kibble onto like a metal tin would set her off. It mm. was a bark blocks away somebody walking on the trail and all of that still exists, but we've done a ton of slow desensitization and counter conditioning playing sounds that she has a history of being 
reactive and sensitive to at low levels with tons of positive, like paired with tons of positive reinforcement, like her favorite type of affection or playing with her favorite toy or a treat that she particularly likes. And then slowly, slowly increasing the volume so that she has a higher tolerance to those sounds. So that's been something that we've worked on a lot and that has helped. And the other thing that I learned recently is that those autonomic nervous system responses, flight, fight, and freeze. In dogs, the flight, for some reason, flight doesn't activate as well. A lot of dogs have to be taught how to retreat, which is why you'll see a fear reactive dog approach another dog or another human in an aggressive manner instead of immediately running away from the thing they're afraid of. So we have done some flight training where she has this cue, run away. So she'll see someone out on the beach. She'll run out on the deck and she'll yell at them. And then I'll go out and I'll be like, hey, it's okay. It's okay. She'll look at me. She'll look at them. She'll bark. I'll say, let's run away. And then we, you know, we run indoors and then she's fine. And we've done that enough now that she will go outside. She'll bark. I'll go outside and I'll say, hey, friends, everything's okay. She'll look at me and she'll just come back inside. So she's developing that flight response in a healthy way, which has helped a lot with some of her fear reactivity and sound sensitivity. We practice a whole lot of active management. The place where we live is pretty unique. It's at the base of a cliff. There's this boardwalk that on one side it's steep cliff and on the other side it's tidal water. So the boardwalk's quite narrow and there are off-leash dogs that just sort of are community dogs that are constantly walking and there's kids running and playing and people coming and going and that's just too much for Bunny. She needs a little bit more space than that. So managing the environment in a way that she doesn't have to encounter those people. She doesn't have to be close to them. We don't have to force our dogs to be non-reactive in environments that they are miserable in. We can just change the environment. And that's played a huge role in our success too. Just not putting her in environments wherein she can't succeed. Setting our dogs up for success. Using a box fan to create some white noise is huge, so helpful. Just this tiny little thing just blocks out some of the ambient noise and helps her self-regulate. Yeah, having training cues like this way, like quick turnaround cues, so that if we are walking towards somebody and we see a, a dog and a person and we can't escape left or right or off trail, we just go this way and run in the opposite direction. These are all things that have really helped us. And for me personally, practicing not being reactive when she reacts. So really breathing through those reactions. And I am uh, particularly sound sensitive myself. So when she barks and it feels like it's out of the blue, it's very upsetting to my nervous system as well. And so my first instinct is to be like, ah, no, stop. Right. And instead of that, mm -hmm. I now it's okay, bunny. We're all good. Everything is just fine. Mm -hmm. And that helps, right? I mean, I don't think anyone in their right mind would would think that uh, the best way to encourage a dog to stop yelling is to yell at it, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's been a great a great practice for myself to bring myself down from that high level of anxiety that her reactivity mm -hmm. causes, and keep myself at like a an even keel so that I can help her. Yeah, that's really helpful, and I think that like. Maisie's bark is very piercing and I know it's mm -hmm. especially hard on my husband's ears and often it comes from nowhere in our estimation. I'm sure that there's a reason for her. So it's startling. And I think people often will yell no or no bark at their dogs. And mm -hmm. so then the dog just thinks, oh, you're barking too. So I'm going to bark more. Now it's a party. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think people just don't always understand you know, ways to respond. Let's do this. Let's talk about you being a family dog mediator and what that means. And then we're going to circle back because I think that will help people understand a little bit more about how broad your training is and, and the knowledge that you're coming into all of this so that you're not just someone who, you know, bought a dog and read some books. Yeah. Oh, which I, <laughs> you know, I still am. I still am that person. <laughs> But I've also taken a lot of courses recently that have sort of helped my understanding of behavior evolve. And one of my favorites of those courses was Kim Brophy's Legs course. And that is a course in applied ethology. 
And the licensure that resulted from that is a license, I'm now a licensed family dog mediator in the library division. And what that means and what that, well, what that means to me is sort of looking at behavior and how we move forward in our relationships with non-human animals through the lens of applied ethology. And to me, applied ethology feels like one of the most holistic ways to view it because you're bringing in these elements of genetics and learning history and self and environment to sort of see this bigger picture. And it's less about changing behavior sort of directly, which can be quite invasive and manipulative and more about understanding why the behavior occurs Mm -hmm. to add whatever like enrichment or to add something to the dog's world that can be valuable enough to them that their behavior sort of changes naturally. Which is as a therapist and a coach, if somebody comes to me and they want to stop being, I'm, I'm terrible at thinking of examples on off the top of my head, but if you have their child is doing an unwanted behavior and they want the behavior stopped, I'm just like, it's like, let's look at the need that's underneath it. Yeah. And almost all behavior is motivated by an underlying need and we can stop the behavior, but if it doesn't address what the need is, then it's just going to pop. It's like playing the gopher game. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) If you're anxious and you know, you're eating, then you you don't address what you're anxious about and you stop the eating, then you're going to start watching TV or you're going to start spending or you're going to have sex. And it's like your dog is going to dig things or they're going to chew things up or they're going to start barking or, you know, yeah. it's just about having needs and trying to really understand what those needs are and trying to meet those needs and, and understand it without having to label or pathologize in humans or in animals. Absolutely. It's yeah. really compassionate. You know, it's a yeah. very compassionate approach. And I would want somebody to do that with me as well, not telling me to stop a behavior, but to try and understand what is it that I keep doing this thing that may not be working for me, but there's a need that I'm trying to get met or working something out. Exactly. And most yeah. reactivity is, is emotionally driven. So really getting to the bottom of what are they feeling and why? Like, why are they afraid? And how can we address the fear versus... I want my dog to stop barking. I want my dog to be less afraid. Like, right, right. That's like you said, the compassionate way. Yeah. And when I've talked with people about, you know, having a puppy that's very barky, you know, I've people have suggested getting the shock collars. Like, it's just like a little buzz. It doesn't hurt them or getting a a, can with pennies in it or getting a spray bottle. And people say, I just hold the spray bottle up to my dog and the dog stops. It's like, yeah, but well, why don't you respond to that? (laughs) I mean, (laughs) doing something like that would never have occurred to me because when you view animals through the lens of sort of non-human personhood with their own opinions and ideas and feelings, it does not seem to me like a compassionate way to interact with another person to spray Mm -hmm. bottles, to threaten them, right? Like Mm -hmm. don't do this or this is going to happen. That's just not the way that I interact with people. It's not the way that I interact with animals. Right. It doesn't seem kind to me. So it would never cross my mind to do that. And there can be quite a bit of fallout when things like that are used. You can suppress the behavior to the point that they they get to a breaking point and then a a more extreme behavior is demonstrated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just think that there are methods that are kinder and more compassionate and will really get to the root of the problem versus just sort of masking it. And it's very similar to parenting that many parents want to do traditional because I said so, power over parenting. You did this, here's what the consequences as opposed to gentle parenting, which is really trying to understand what is it that the needs of the child are and doing more natural and logical consequences. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with animals. And I and I still see a lot of you should have dominance over your dog and you know, you want to be the leader of the pack and all these ways that you can be aggressive. I've I've even had some challenges on the leash and my tendency is to take more of an authoritative controlling type of approach because I've just been so stuck sometimes with Mm -hmm. the pulling. Yeah. You know, that that's not how I want to work with my dog. And something that's so counterintuitive, but that can be so helpful is, okay, so your dog is pulling on the leash. Well, maybe what they need is more off leash time. And then you start Mm -hmm. offering them more opportunities to explore the world without having the control over them. And all of a sudden they're like, great, I am fulfilled. I got my time to explore with freedom and now I'm fine to walk on the leash. 
And that can sound, I mean, it, it really does sound sort of counterintuitive, but I've seen a lot of that in the behaviors in my own dogs, where mm-hmm. if you don't allow them access to something, they're going to want it more, right? Right. Allow them access right. to that thing, and then you won't have to worry about it later. Right. Yeah. I don't know if this is going to work. Can we talk about my dog's barkiness and see if we can come up with something? And I will list Kim Brophy's information in the show notes. We're working with a trainer. And actually, the trainer that we found connected me with you. And and she had also recommended Kim Brophy. And Kim Brophy has a YouTube channel. So there's she's a great resource, has books. So yeah, I'd love to share that with other people. Yeah. And I want to mention here that I am not a dog trainer or a behavior mm-hmm. consultant. I have uh, this family dog mediation information in my brain, but I'm I'm not necessarily qualified to help you modify any behavior. I should throw that out there. Okay. But I'm happy to chat about it with you. I love talking about behavior. Sure, sure. So she's terrier. Terriers, as I've learned after the fact, <laughs> are very talkative. Mm-hmm. And it feels like there are two kinds of barks that she has. One is there are dogs that walk by that I don't know why she just doesn't like them. And so she's, I think it's like, get out of here. I don't want you here. Get away. We have a side fence that she can watch dogs. So she runs from the front door, which is a screen door to the side yard where there's a side fence. So she can, you know, tell people to get out. She does have her warning bark. We we do. It's funny. We have a neighbor that we've had some major problems with. It's right next door. She can hear when he comes home that the whole house can be closed up and he'll walk his dog at like 11 o'clock at night and I'll be sleeping and she's barking because she hears him walking his dog. And so when that happens, I tell her she's okay. You know, you're safe. I've got you. Thanks for letting me know. But sometimes the barking and it seems like since she's hit adolescence, it's just even it's a very insistent, insistent barking. Yeah. What I try and do is to get up and touch her, tell her that she's okay. She's safe we're good. Are you concerned? Do you hear a sound? I also keep kibble on me. And so I often will just throw kibble away from the door to just get her to move away from the door. And she's pretty responsive to that. But I always, I forget, I go out, I look like I must be an animal trainer for SeaWorld because I always have the dog (laughs) pouch on me. (laughs) Oh, me too. I have got cookies in my pockets, all of my pockets. They've gone through the wash, still cookies in them, no matter what. Yep. Yep. The treat bag went through the wash. I hear you. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that all sounds totally like normal behavior to me. And she's in adolescence right now. So they're going to be testing boundaries and like are being flooded with hormones. So those are things to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Management strategies, you could block all visual access to Mm -hmm. people and animals walking outside. There's like this removable film that you can put on windows that's frosted that works quite well. Okay. Or blinds, box fans. I think I mentioned that before work really well as sort of white noise and blocking out some of that sound. I've seen some people turn thank you into a cue to come get treats. So dog barks, you say thank you. They get a, a storm of like really high value treats on the ground, they start barking again, thank you, or that's enough, or whatever your cue is going to be. And then over time, they learn that they bark, and then they come to you for treats. And that happens every single time. We keep treats by the back door. And so when we call her in, but it's funny, I think sometimes, honestly, it feels like she barks for treats. Oh, really? (laughs) (laughs) There's not a cue and she barks. She looks at us like, do I get something now? But for the most part, that's a a strategy that we use. But anyways, please go ahead. That's funny. I wonder if you could turn that into a whisper then instead. I've trained whisper for both bunny and otter. And sometimes when they're barking in sort of a demand way, I think those demand barks, because what they want is engagement with you, are easier to transition into something else, right? Because they're like, do something with me, do something with me. If they're demand barking at you, maybe you can teach teach a whisper or turn that into some other cue, uh, and turn that into okay. a fun little game. Okay. I mean, I think it's good now that you understand that terriers do have a voice. I don't think it's reasonable to expect that any dog will never bark. But as yeah. somebody who is quite sound sensitive myself, I understand how jarring that can be and mm-hmm. frustrating, especially if you're asleep. So management in my opinion, is always going to be your first step. So those visual barriers, the white noise. Is she a particularly anxious dog? 
I don't think so. I don't think that she is. I know at night she paces if we don't play with her enough when we go mm-hmm. to settle to watch TV. I, I'll say, you know, let's go to work. And she's so good. She comes into the office and she's quiet for the day. I didn't put any buttons in the office. And then when I'm done or I take a break, I tell her work, work all done. And so she knows she can go out and play. But I know at night she's a little bit more restless because I think she wants to play, you know, yeah. exercise her in the morning. But I wanted to ask you, I have this thing in my mind and I need you to help provide another perspective. If we block off the side fence where she can't see, I have this thing like that's mean because she likes to watch things. So can you help reframe that for me? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it just depends on what what's going to work the best for your situation. There are ways, Mm -hmm. uh, because looking out at the environment or hearing sounds from outside is a form of passive enrichment, but there are other ways you can get that. You can, there's dog TV. You can turn on the nature channel inside. You can play sounds of nature. I've done that for bunny and otter before, and that is passive enrichment. It's going to have them using their mind, which is great and will keep them from being just completely bored. Of course, active enrichment is really important as well. I don't know if you do too much of that, but I think incorporating plenty of that as well as whatever physical activity and like personal play you're doing could be a way to set her up for more success at night. She might just be a little bit on the calmer side if you're giving her some puzzles or or some ways to sort of activate and engage her brain. Do you do any of that or much of that with her? We have lots of puzzles. She loves the flirt pole. She has a bear that she loves. She loves to play with the dog down the street. Those are the main things that we do. And then I try and get her to the beach off leash at least twice a week yeah, so that she can play in the water. And she's not crazy about playing in water at home. But those are the primary. I've tried to do nose work with her. I probably need to try it more. So if you're not familiar with nose work, what, what our trainer told us was to put a smell like on a card and have her see it and then hide it and have her look for it. And then you have her smell it and then you send her out of the room and you hide it. I also like to hide kibble around the house or kibble outside, or I do scatter feeding or I put kibble in a towel and roll it up and tie a knot in it. I've got a bunch of it's balls perfect. to make her work for her food. So yeah. Do you do nose work with Bunny? I don't. I haven't done a ton of nose work with Bunny. We've done barn hunt a couple of times and she What's was that? She was really confused by it, but seemed to enjoy it. It's uh, like a UKC and AKC sport wherein they train rats through positive reinforcement to hang out in these little tubes. And Mm -hmm. you train the dog on the scent of the rat. You bury the tube in and amongst these hay bales. And then the dogs have to like find the scent of the rat. And before they get to it, they learn to alert to it. And you pick up the tube, you give it to the, the judge or whatever. That's pretty fun. Super exhausting for her. She did one round and she was like, I'm exhausted. Oh, does she have any opportunity to dig? That's a, that's a thing that a lot of terriers really, really enjoy. I taught her the word dig when we went to the beach so I could teach her no dig at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we were going to create a place for her to dig and we just haven't done it because she has dug a number of holes in her backyard, which my husband's not really happy about. But we do have a place where we can dig for, and she she likes to dig. So yeah, that's definitely something. And, you know, for those of you that are listening, if you don't know, scent work or taking your dogs on walks where you just let them smell can exhaust Absolutely. them. You know, I think people have this idea that you have to throw a ball or you have to walk a dog or run a dog to tire them out. But when you use their senses, their brain or their nose, you can do 15 minutes of work and it is equivalent to an hour's worth of exercise. If I'm wrong on that, please correct me if those numbers are wrong, but I don't know what not the, knowing much about dogs. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what the direct equivalency is, but I know that it works. I know that we don't, yeah. we don't have to take a walk every day. If I give them plenty of enrichment, they're exhausted and fulfilled and happy and relaxed. So yeah, yeah. it really, it really does wonders. And it encourages them to be more curious and to use their brains and to problem solve. So en- enrichment is a really beautiful way to engage with your dog. In terms of digging, so this could be one of those situations where she doesn't have access to digging because you don't want her digging here, don't want her digging here. You give her like a sandbox full of some fun mm-hmm. digging stuff. That's her digging spot. And that sort of allows her to fulfill or meet that need. And then she doesn't she doesn't have to dig anywhere else. Maybe that behavior stops. That could be an out. I bought a pool to do that. And we went to Home Depot. I feel like I'm, I'm the yes, but I have a client. We have this thing because she's resistant. So we I have her do this like resistance whenever she has it. So I feel like I'm doing that to you. <laughs> <It's all good. laughs> so this is my yes, but 
We went to Home Depot and we looked at all the stands and tried to find something that we thought was safe for the dog and we weren't sure that we could find it. So I think what I need to do is to do some research and find out what is safe, either sand or dirt wise for her. And we do have a pool that we yeah. can totally do that in. And I think she would love that because she, she really does like to dig. So yeah, I mean, yeah. you could potentially fill it with exactly the same stuff that she is digging in currently in your yard, whatever mm -hmm. that is. And who knows? Yeah. And you could yeah. bury fun toys in there, incorporate scent work into that too. Could be super fun. Some dogs really like sprinklers. Um, it sounds like she's got a flirt pole. Uh, does she have a, a fairly high prey drive? That's something that's not uncommon Very high. in too. Yeah. And the flirt pole right now is her favorite. And she is so fast with it. I'm just amazed at how, and that's her favorite thing. That's what she asked for most, the, most of the time. Great. Yeah. And does that yeah. tire her out? No. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I'll take her, I'll take her to the beach and she'll run for, you know, an hour and come home and I, ex I expect her to just be exhausted and then she's got energy. It just kind of amazes me. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those instances where sometimes I feel like we'll go on this amazing, huge, active sniff walk. We'll go on the beach and then we'll go up the cliffs into the park and it's not until we come home and I put some other type of enrichment in front of them that they're really able to like settle and sort of turn off their brain and just engage. But there are different, I mean, there are different types of enrichment too. Some enrichment will bring a dog up and some enrichment will bring a dog down. Like licking is right. a form of enrichment that will really calm a dog. So like licky mats with like mm -hmm. peanut butter or yogurt and then frozen and then they mm -hmm. just lick it for half an hour. Yeah. Those are really good for bringing a dog down out of that sort of aroused state. Yeah. Yeah. Those are some great ideas. Before we end, I would love to have you, I kind of wish we, I would have remembered to do this in the previous episode that we did, but this is good enough. Can you share some instances of when Bunny, and I don't know if Otter has, has been able to communicate that they've been hurt because of the sound buttons? Because I think that's, as a pet owner, as a parent, you know, it's hard to watch somebody that you love suffering and not knowing what's going on. And so this is one of the most important things, I think. So can you share a little bit about that? Sure. As we know, dogs and cats and most animals are experts at hiding that because it's seen as a form mm -hmm. of weakness, right? So it's sort of a, right. a survival mechanism. But yeah, I added an ouch button and I, I modeled it quite a bit and I had incorporated some body parts, I think ear and paw we had at that point in time. And not too long after I added the ouch button, she was able to tell me that she had a cut on her nose. Mm. She pressed the ouch button and then pawed at her nose. And I saw a little mm. cut there. And then shortly thereafter, she said paw ouch. And there was a foxtail in her paw. And then later that summer, we've got a huge problem with foxtails here. She, she said, ouch, help stranger paw, something like that. Mm-hmm. And walked over to me and put her paw in my hand, found another fox tail in her paw. She was able to tell me when she had an ear infection, ear ouch. And then mm. she shook her head and came over and put her head in, in my mm. hand. And when Otter came home, she smelled his ear and went over to the buttons and pressed ear, ear smell. And I went over to him and I smelled his ear too. And I was like, oh yeah, that's definitely an ear infection. So we mm. treated that. And interestingly, the next day, Otter did the exact same thing, went over to the buttons and pressed ear smell, just you know, copying, copying exactly what she did, which I, I feel like is so much of how he's learning to use mm -hmm. the buttons now. So yeah, there have been several instances and there are so much that our dogs can communicate with us already, right? Like I know when my dog wants to play, they don't need buttons for that. I know when she wants to go outside, I know when she's mad or mm -hmm. happy, all of that. But I don't necessarily know when she's in pain. I don't think I would have known had she not had the buttons. And I think what they're particularly valuable for is for us to learn things about them that, that we absolutely couldn't know in any other way. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the examples in which they're definitely an enrichment to our relationship and to their welfare. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, we've been teaching her her body parts. And even when she goes to the bathroom outside, you know, I'm Maisie P now, Maisie Poop now, so that if she has a problem, she can also use ouch. I'm sure I'm sure if our neighbor hears me, <laughs> Maisie P now, Maisie P all done, Maisie Poop, Maisie Poop all done. <laughs> I love it. Can you imagine there's so many of us? But I want so to have that language. Us. There's so many of us now, like walking around the world, like bunny want play. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> just hilarious i, I learned it. the hmm from you and i use it all the time oh, all good. the time so that makes me so yeah. happy <laughs> yeah it, it's funny i have this video of you know i when i'm done working Maisie always shows me her belly and so i rub her belly this is your belly these are your paws these are your you know yeah and then my husband will play with her this, these are your paws. These are your ears. This is your mouth. <laughs> so I made a video because it's just so funny that our styles are so different, but she loves the roughhousing with him, but I don't tend to roughhouse with her very much. And I don't think she likes it when I do it, but she loves it when he does it. It's just fascinating. I think that's so fascinating. I think a lot about that, actually, the the different relationships that these dogs have with the other people cohabitating mm-hmm. with them, right? Like my relationship with Bunny is totally different than Johnny's relationship with her. And she just like adores both of us and we serve Mm -hmm. or fill different roles. And it's the same for Otter. And I think that is so cool. It just, it just confirms how complex they are and how unique the relationships that we can have with them are and, and how deeply they experience emotions and connection. Yeah. Yeah. I think what I'd like to do is let's see to the listener, if you've enjoyed this, because we didn't get to talk about Bunny's existential stuff where she talks about I human, I dog, you, you know, we family, she has dreams, she tells you about her dreams. So to the listener, and if you're in the closed Facebook group, Unapologetically Sensitive, if you're enjoying these conversations, reach out to me and let me know. I'll look at the downloads and see how interested y'all are and let me know. And if Alexis is willing to come back, then I'd be more than happy. I mean, as long as you're willing to come back, Alexis, I'd love to talk about as much of this stuff as we want. I just don't know how much y'all are interested in hearing about it because I could talk about it for days on end. I could too, and I'd be happy to come back. So it's up to you listeners. (laughs) That would be great. Alexis, is there anything else that you wanted to share, even if it's not exactly what we were talking about today before we end? Because I just feel like there's so much to talk about that we just can't capture it all. There is so much to talk about. I I think ending it on the, they're not giving us a, a hard time. They're having a hard time note is important because I think me internalizing and remembering that phrase has been really helpful in my own journey too with mm-hmm. self-compassion. I think yeah. sometimes we we are able to offer that compassion to our animals before we're able to offer it to ourselves. But yep. I think it's important in order to be fully present and fully empathetic to have as much self-compassion as we can as well. Yeah. And if you have kids, if you are working with elderly parents for yourself. It's funny, Alexis, you and I had a bunch of back and forth emails about equipment for recording. And because I know you, the listener, are very sensitive about what the sound is, I really had this little gremlin about, oh, she's going to think I'm really difficult to work with because I'm like, nope, that's not going to work. We've got to try this. Do you have this? What about that? And I thought, I have to trust that and let it be okay. And again, it's like, it's not like I was trying to give you a hard time. This is what I know works for a good podcast recording for the listeners. So we can also use that self-compassion with ourselves of we're not trying to be difficult. We just know what we need or we know what's going to work and really reframing that negative narrative that I think we've received and internalized and how we project that into the world with our pets, our partners, our kids, whomever. Absolutely. And I I didn't interpret it as you being difficult. I interpret it as you being the expert and this is how to make this a success for everyone involved. So, yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for being here. Tell people where they can find you. Oh, you can find me on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at whataboutbunny or at whataboutbunny.com. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Alexis. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. This was a blast. All right. Thanks. Hey again. I'm curious to know what you thought of this episode. Again, I just love these episodes with Alexis. So if you are still here, (laughs) my guess is that you're also interested. Please shoot me an email. If you're in the closed Facebook group called Unapologetically Sensitive, there are three questions that you need to answer to join the group. 
please let me know if you're interested in more episodes like this, because I love these conversations with Alexis and I would love to have her on again. I think there are so many parallels in this episode to what we experience as deep feelers and deep thinkers. And knowing that we're not trying to give people a hard time. Our animals are not trying to give us a hard time. Our kids are not trying to give us a hard time. Our partners are not trying to give us a hard time. When we struggle, that's when you're going to see behaviors that are challenging. And I was just talking with a friend the other day about something and, and the behavior that she was talking about of somebody that she knows was very, the behavior's not okay. But looking at it from what is going on around that behavior, I think adds a whole new lens of compassion. And the same thing goes on for us and for our animals. How can we be gentle, compassionate, have lots of mindfulness and self-compassion for ourselves, for our animals, for our kids, for our partners, for our parents, for our employers, for our colleagues. I just think that the things that we talk about in this podcast, we always have to have content to talk about. But I think that what we're talking about can be very universal and very helpful. That's what I think. I don't know what you think, but I just thought this was a great episode and I love Alexis's expertise. Switching gears. We are heading into fall now. It's about mid-fall. Hope you were doing well. Hope you were enjoying the cooler weather, depending on where you're at. If you are interested in working with me, if you struggle with perfectionism, setting boundaries, people pleasing, having conflict, I find that most HSPs do not like doing things that are going to cause upset, conflict, and we often self-sacrifice. We're really good at knowing what other people are wanting and showing up for other people, but we kind of erase ourselves in the process. And are you comfortable talking about your needs, asking to get your needs met? Do you trust that people can be there for you? These are signs of wounding. There is part of this as being an HSP, but often when we haven't gotten our needs met and we need to attune for other people, and that's how we get our sense of connection, you have a right to all of your feelings. You have a right to having needs. You have a right to ask for what you want. My hope is that your relationships are reciprocal and satisfying. If you're in relationship with anybody, there will be conflict. That's just part of being human. Being human means it's messy and complicated, but it shouldn't be painful, devastating, with having extreme loneliness, that my hope is that you have relationships and people that you trust and you can show up and share when you are struggling and things are not going as well. I know that our tendency is to want to pull back and wait until we're feeling better to re-engage in relationships. And sometimes we need to do that. But my hope is that you have people who can see you in your beautiful, messy humanness. It's challenging. Just last night I was poloing Jen because I've been going through this thing where I just, I, <laughs> I have this wound where I feel like there's just something fatally flawed with me. And I know that it's not true. And I was able to know that in the moment, but just to hear her reflect that I could show up no matter how I was and she's got me and she's here for me. Whew, brought tears to my eyes because I just feel like this is what the truth is. Sometimes I know it's not, but we all struggle with this stuff. I don't care who you are. I don't care how much therapy you've had. I don't care if you're a therapist. Being human means we have wounds and things get activated. If you're struggling, I would love to be here to support you. You can reach out to me at unapologeticallysensitive.com. If you are enjoying these episodes with Alexis, please shoot me an email at unapologeticallysensitive at gmail.com. Or if you're part of our closed Facebook group, also called Unapologetically Sensitive, please let me know what you thought because I would love to do more of these if you're all interested. And if not, that's okay. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's your superpower. Have a blessed day. 